everybody, Josh Wilson, and this is the Big Dog Podcast. These next couple of weeks, we are celebrating one year anniversary of the podcast launching. And so Jonathan, and I thought it would be fun if we kind of recapped some of our favorite moments over the last year and some of your guys' favorite moments. So what you're going to be hearing today are some of our literally favorite moments of a couple episodes uh, that took place over that last year. And that's, what's going to play out over the next several weeks. So no guests live in the studio. I'm not sharing thoughts. We just know that there's so many new listeners, you know, over these last 12 months and we've grown so much in, in recent months, we want to kind of recap those highlights for you. So that's what you're going to experience. I hope that you love it. Hope that you share it. And we're going to be back in the next, next couple of weeks with some amazing content, some incredible guests, and I appreciate you guys so much. We'll see you soon. Do, But as you're learning these things, is your primary crew learning these things along the way with you? Absolutely. Or, okay, so when, as you're growing and adding to the team, you know, your, your foundation, your crew, your base crew, they're the type of guys who want to get better. They want to be challenged. They want to learn more. The disconnect with growth has been with more of those support roles. Yes. more entry level roles and stuff. Yeah, so so ideally you want to hire somebody that knows exactly 100% what to do from the get go. Like I would love to hire somebody that's smarter than me in installing pavers or intricate designs on decks and things like that, but it's not easy to find in this industry and I think this is where it makes it very difficult is the fact that the um the, the the guys that you really have to train you have to train the people that are on your crew right now right to 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 grow with the company because you can't just find those guys those guys that have that experience are out there trying to start their own business yeah yeah right unfortunately right. you know you almost can you can almost train a guy to a certain level and then all of a sudden that um guy decides to go start his own business. I'm yep. sure it's like that in a lot of different 100%. situations, but I think it's compounded in the landscaping industry because yeah. I mean, especially like grass cutting. I mean, you see how many grass cutters are out there, especially when the economy tanked back in, you know, 08, 07, yep. it's like all of a sudden everybody has a mower. That's well, right. It. But you, you made the comment a little, a little while ago about, Hey, you pull up to the light and you're like to the left of you, the right of you across from you. It's just trucks and trailers yeah. and logos. You're like, how do we, how do we differentiate ourselves? Because from a consumer standpoint, I just need somebody to cut my lawn. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's uh, unless there's something special that you're, you're, you're looking into and 90% of the landscape companies start and finish at cutting lawn. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. Then you've got, at least from my perspective, you've got this, this 10% number that get into lighting that get into irrigation, that get into sod, that get into more, intensive things like the 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 paver work and stuff and design mm -hmm. like that's a much smaller group but if everybody's just sitting there at the light and you're sitting there at the light as a consumer and you're just seeing these trucks and trailers you don't know that of who does the the specialty stuff and, and who doesn't because you're still mowing lawns you still have crews cutting and doing maintenance right yeah and yeah. then you've got your crew that's out doing the specialty stuff mm -hmm. um and so, yeah, the guys that are more skilled, that know they add a lot of value, if they're not feeling used in a good way and fulfillment, yeah, they're going to try to bounce and, and do the deal. Or they feel like they can do these things mm -hmm. and they don't think about the difficulties of running a business, getting the jobs, hiring staff, and all. It's just like, well, they don't... They don't like the way you correct them that day. Yeah. And so they're like, see, I'm going to do it. And next thing you know, tomorrow they've got a truck with a sticker on the side of it because it's that easy to do. Or they jump to another landscape, another landscaper, whatever it may be, because there's plenty out there and everybody's looking for people right now. Mm -hmm. I feel like landscapers are always looking for people regardless. Um, but like in our industry, it's the same thing. You train them up, yep. you teach them, you know, and it's like, well, I'm just going to do this on my own. Well, okay. Okay. Good luck. I, I wish you the best, but they don't understand what it takes mm -hmm. for there to be opportunities to earn day in and day out. Like your guys want to work. They're working because you've got work for them. Yeah. You have jobs in place that didn't just happen. Like you, you didn't just wake up today and have a successful business. You've been working on this thing for how long? 
since oh, high three. school? Oh, yeah, I mean, high school, but yeah, oh, 03 practically. So 18 years. Yeah, you know, just overnight success. Yeah. That we have steady work every day and my trucks to drive, <laughs> you know, my equipment to use. Yeah, and, 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 and I appreciate the guys that are, have been sticking with me, you know, the longest. And, and the more they learn, the more they can grow and the more they can make, you know, and, you know, For sure. it, it takes a special person to understand that. Yep. and understand that there is a business side of things. So I try to explain that yeah. clearly to my guys and and, and go from there. And, but know. not everybody that's going to click for, right? No. And like you could have the most skilled employee who's just tremendous. They add a ton of value and they know how to work every piece of equipment. They know how to, to, to cut, <laughs> to, to design. Yeah. They can do everything. They'll never understand the business side and they don't need to, but they need to understand that they're valued by you and that you appreciate them showing up every day and that they execute at a high level. And that's why they stay with you, yeah. you know? And so they can understand those things, but it, sometimes like, I don't care about the business piece. Like, I just want to get out here and run this equipment. That's what they love. And that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I so when I hire people, I always ask them, I say, okay, so we have a wide range of things you can do. Right. Okay. You have a little experience, but I can teach you anything you want to do. Yep. So here are the different aspects of my company. Yep. Yeah, grass cutting, monotonous, day after day, same thing. If that's you, cool. Let me put you on that crew. If you just want to come to work, punch the clock, yep. do what needs to be done, same thing every week. Then I got other skilled labor that I need to get people on board with. You know, if you want to do pavers, I'll teach you how to do pavers. Yep. You know, and 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 you'll make more money doing that, but it's gonna always be changing. But it, it's hard. Yep. I mean, in the middle of summer. We had that heat blast a couple of weeks ago. Yep. And I mean, my guys hung in there and I mean, it was, it felt like 110 degrees outside and we're out there laying pavers in the full sun. Right. And just drenched and, you know, they stuck with it. And, um, you know, that's, 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 that's where the opportunity is for, for individuals to come aboard and grow. And, and I, you know, I, I have goals well beyond right now in my head that, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to in the, in the future is yeah. breaking it up into separate companies and I need people to run those separate companies Yeah, and I want to hire within because they know the system and the way things go already. So that's the opportunity that somebody can have yep. is to literally run the company, a section of the company. Yeah. Division, you know, and, and, and I mean, I'm still looking for those type of people now. Yeah. You know, I, I, we, we need people that vibe. You know, I hate, I hate, I hate drama for sure. You know, that's the number one thing. Don't, don't bring drama to work. <laughs> yeah. Leave I mean, it in the car. Like, yeah. I'm, it's uh it's one of those things. It's like, I leave my, my situations yep. away from here, you know, handle it when you're at home or whatever. Right. And that's tough too, because guys, particularly like in your work, I mean, they're spending a lot long days together there. There's physical labor. They're sweating together. They're bleeding together. You know, they're spending more time together than they are with, you know, family, friends, you know, and whatnot. Yeah. And so it, it, inevitably they're going to get close. So what do you do with people you're close with? You talk, whatever. But so easily that day can just go from a mood standpoint to just dropping because one dude starts bitching about something. Then the next one kind of piles in yeah. on it. And you're sitting there like, guys, can we let – just, let's just work. Let's, let's just, just get, get this, this done. done. <laughs> like yeah. we, we can get out of here. Like, let's just knock it out. Let's execute at the level we need to. And that's tough because you're, you're on the job. Your mind is thinking about 8,000 different things and it's not dismissing their frustrations or concerns, but the noise of it, right? There's enough yeah. noise in our heads as business owners and operators. Yeah. You just kind of want to take the machine and swing the bucket and wipe everybody out, <laughs> you know, and you love them, but you uh, just have those days, right? Yeah, absolutely. Everybody has those days and, you know, and we can, we can deal with it to a degree. Sure. You know, and I, I try to, I try to help people out, um, giving them my advice in the situations and yeah. such, but you know, you got to execute. Can't always be therapy. Absolutely. And therapy is important. So well, I have, I have a quick question. Yeah. So did I hear you say that you don't run ads on your business? We do not. You do not. Okay, so that's really interesting because um, I'm not sure if you've heard, but the last ep episode that we did with the guest yeah. was Scott. Mm -hmm. He's the marketing guy, real yep. big on ads and SEO. So I find it cool that um, 
opposition between ads and not running ads. Yeah, Could you speak so, to how you run your business not yeah, doing that? Yeah. So we we run our business. I hate to say it, but like correctly. Not not that people need to advertise that yeah. don't run it correctly. But I learned from early on that if you follow up with clients' needs and you fully fulfill their needs, you completely satisfy that customer, then they're gonna recommend you and it's gonna be returned tenfold. And I believe now that I've been in business, of course, for 18 years, um, it's something that comes natural is the um, referral base. Yep, for sure. And, and I'm comfortable with the size that I'm at. Yes. So there's some people that wanna be nationwide, there's some people that want to be statewide. Um, I've reduced over the years my distance of, of doing jobs. I don't go on the south side anymore for any more grass yeah. cutting and things like that. I'm mainly on the peninsula and into Williamsburg. We still do some stuff on the south side, but um, I've just become comfortable in business. And I've realized that I have more leads than I, I need. Yeah. And, and, and to be honest, I, I don't even fulfill the, I could easily just go through my customer base and just call them and say, Hey, how you doing? And unfortunately, right. like, I just don't, I mean, that's one thing that I kind of wish I did better, Sure, but just the everyday being so busy and I'm just comfortable. But they feel, but the thing is though, you're comfortable. And I think people will take comfort as two different things. Like there's comfortable and there's, settling yeah there's comfort and then there's complacent yeah there you go see he's got better words he's smart so (laughs) you did um but that that's such a key thing because you have yeah i'm still grinding you have clarity on who you are who your business's identity is and for like like honestly the stuff i'm talking about in the in the episode that dropped today Mm -hmm. that's live um has everything to do with the comment that you just made like you have complete clarity and you have a vision for where you want to be. You're not chasing what other businesses in your industry are doing. You know, you 18 years in, you've been through so many different things, yeah. different seasons of the business. You know, the things you like to do, you know, the things you don't, you know, the things that you do well, you know, the things that you don't, you know, from a leadership standpoint, where your limitations are, where you excel, you know what you want your days to look like. And that doesn't mean every day looks that way. Mm -hmm. But if most do, that's a great place to be. That's a great place to be. And there isn't this pressure for unnecessary growth. Mm -hmm. And here's the, the reality though, too. If staffing was different, you could take on more of the leads that you aren't able to do. Cause even though you got all these referrals, 100%. which is so key, you're not, even if everybody, one of those referrals wants to work with you, cause it was just a bomb ass referral. You're not going to be able to accommodate whatever timeline line they may have for themselves. So they're going to go elsewhere and you're comfortable with that. And, and this is all industry specific. Sure. I mean, there's, there's plenty of businesses like your own that can grow. Yep. And, and, and it's just the, f- facts of being a landscaper you know i met a guy maybe 10 years ago while i was buying some equipment and i was like why are you selling this equipment yeah he's like because i had about 125 employees i'm down to 25 now i'm making more money now and i have a lot less headaches yep i go hmm so it was just really interesting to think about i mean especially in the landscaping industry you know i i i've grown to 25 or 26 employees yeah And we're down to 12 to 15 and I'm a lot more happier now. Yeah. So it's just the niche that I've, you know, I'm comfortable. And people lose sight of that. Like I'm at half, you're at half the staff you were at, at your max. Yeah. And you're like, I'm way happier. This is just easy. And like, you don't have to get sucked into this growth thing. And the thing is you are growing but you don't necessarily have to grow in the way that you thought that you did. Mm-hmm. Nick, uh, hit us up. Just tell us a little, little about you, family, you know, the business. What's up? How's everybody? Hey, what's up guys? Nick white off leash canine training. 
Um, I am the owner and founder of Off Leash Canine, 143 locations, about 580 trainers now throughout the U.S. So crazy. Uh, kind of throughout the world because of London. So now yeah. I have to say world. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so I started Off Leash. A little background on me. I'm a former U.S. Marine, former United States Secret Service. And when I was in the Secret Service, that's where I really kind of started getting into dogs, learning about dogs, stuff like that. And what's funny is, you know, now it's the largest dog training business in the country um, and one of the most well-known and celebrity clients and the list goes on and on. But, you know, I, I kind of joke with people that I wasn't this like entrepreneur mastermind when I started. Um, I, a funny story, very few people have heard. I was in the Secret Service. I had a 2010 Nissan Titan at the time. Nice. And my uh, truck payment was like $432 a month. I still remember it, 423 or 432, one of those. And I started really getting into dogs, learning a lot from a lot of uh, really good people. And I started it kind of as a side hustle. Okay. So, uh, but the, the problem is, and the, for those that don't know, the Secret Service is a very demanding, very high paced, long hours, a lot no of way. travel jobs. Secret service. Uh, yeah. Uh Weird. so we're 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 working a lot. <laughs> um so I would I was on midnights at the White House and I would get off my midnight shift, which was about six AM. Then I would drive to a park because at this time again it was just a small side hustle. Right. And do lessons. So usually my first lesson would start at like seven, seven thirty in the morning. And so I would drive to this park change in my Nissan Titan into now my like t-shirt shorts out of my secret service attire, knock out a few lessons, get home at noon, shower, sleep, wake up at 6 PM. And then literally just repeated that. And my goal, I was like, all right. Cause then I was charging literally like $25 per lesson. Yeah, sure. Um, and I was like, okay, if I can get enough clients to pay my $432 truck payment. Yeah. Then like I have a free truck off this like side hustle that I enjoy doing. And it went from that side hustle to pay my $432 truck payment to where it is now. So yeah. And now you could probably cover like a $500 note. <laughs> I mean, you can go full five in and exactly. <laughs> yeah. Now, now I can get the Tesla cyber truck when it comes there out. You go. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the the long story short on the background of kind of where I came from to off leash and uh, for those that don't know, since then I was the host of America's Top Dog on A and E. I've you know been on a, a lot of things, a lot of different news media. Yeah, um, I did training for a lot of celebrity clients at this point, everywhere from Jake Gyllenhaal, Ryan Reynolds, John Cena, you know Max Scherzer, UFC champion John Jones, and. Uh, literally the list keeps going um, crazy logan paul and so yeah that's kind of a, a little bit of background and when i first opened my facility in woodbridge virginia uh, about two years in i just got that facility right before josh here kind of looked at getting his dog trained um, i didn't realize that yeah i only had it i mean because you've you came in 2013. Yeah, 2013. Yeah, early so, 2013. and I started the business in mid 2010. Yeah. So I just got that facility probably a year or so before nice. uh, this young man by the name Josh Wilson calls me. That's again when I, it was very small. It was yeah. me and one other trainer really at this time. So I was taking all calls at this point. And he said, Hey, you know, I, I like your training. I like your videos, but I live in Virginia Beach. Uh, you know, it's like a, <laughs> four hour drive from your facility. Um, I have this dog, I'm looking at getting her trained and uh, I'm like, man, this guy's crazy. He's willing to drive like seven hours round trip one hour to do a one hour private dog training lesson with me. I um, mean, again, keep in mind guys, like, and not that I'm like someone special now, but that like, I was literally kind of like nobody at that point. Like yeah, for I sure. was unheard of, like in the world of dog training really. So now it would make more sense. Um, since I've built this, you know, a right. lot of people in the community know who I am, but then like no one. So I'm like, man, this guy's willing to drive seven hours round trip to do one hour private lesson with me. Is this guy insane? Um, so yeah. And so Josh showed up, knocked out his private lessons every week for what? Eight weeks. Was it eight? Yeah. We did four in a row and you know, we were doing pretty well, Charlotte and mm -hmm. I, and Logan, who's sitting in the studio <laughs> today, hanging out, he came up with us on a couple of lessons. Um, and then we took a gap 
I spread out the advanced classes like every two or three weeks. Help just mitigate to, that drive yeah, time. Yeah, that trip. You, you, know? got the, you got the foundation, which y- yeah, carries we you set. through. Yeah. I didn't want to get rid of this dog anymore. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is legit. This is working great. And so we spread it out a little bit. So it was probably, we did the lessons all together over the course of about three and a half, four months. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was legit. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, Josh did a, uh, unbiasedly, uh, did a, did a really good job with his dog. And, you know, I could tell he's putting the work and stuff and, you know, just one time he's like, man, you should open, you know, one of these down in Virginia beach, you would kill it down here. And I'm like, Oh, you think so? He's like, yeah. And we started talking and now what, eight years later, yeah, we're wrapping up year seven, going into year eight, January will be eight and he's killing it. So it's crazy. <laughs> it all worked out for everyone. It's crazy. All and look and Devin, I mean, she was not happy about the drive or about the like, training, just the money, uh, the time. And, but I mean, I give my wife a lot of credit, a lot of credit. She's <laughs> solid as can be, but she knows that it's something to me, like, just feels like, ah, I know it doesn't make a lot of sense, but I feel like this is what we're something supposed inside to Something inside tells you. Yeah. Like she does have a lot of trust with me with that. And I didn't envision any of this. Oh, yeah, never. I mean, who would? Yeah, right? nobody. I mean, yeah. It's ridiculous. <laughs> but you got to pay attention because sometimes, you know, the universe is trying to direct you. You know, oh, the universe, course. God, whatever you you choose to believe in, if anything, there are bigger forces than ourselves. And if you, there's opportunities. Everybody Everywhere. has opportunities. Everyone. And people act or they don't. Correct. And so, you know, we... We did. We made a decision. We talked about it for a while mm-hmm. before we did it. I was like, man, I'm really loving what I'm doing. You had a good job. This is, you yeah. know, I make good money. I mean, this is a thing. And we talk about this often. <laughs> I, when we decided to do off leash, we thought, and when I told Nick, I said, yeah, I'd, I'd probably train a dog or two a month, make a couple <laughs> bucks, maybe do a nice Yeah, Josh was like, trip you know, with I the can, kids. yeah, I can, I can afford Disney once a year. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's literally yeah. probably an example. It, it was my equivalent of my Nissan. Like right. I can pay off this small bill. Yeah. You know? That's what I could do. Yeah. And it blew off some steam. I really enjoy working with the dogs <laughs> and, you know, and Devin, though, when we started talking about doing it as a business, cause she knew my background, like he doesn't half-ass anything, <laughs> you know, we're, we'll see what happens. But It's just crazy to see what you have built and continue to build based off that decision. And the the motivating factor back in 2010, Mm -hmm. when you started, was not this. Oh, not at all. And it's not where this is going to be 10, 15 years from now. Yeah. But it was a, a simple decision. I was doing what I loved. Yep. And if I can pay a truck payment along the way, so be it. Yeah. Yeah. But then it's like, oh, I have talent with this skill sets with this not only can i teach the dogs i can probably teach other teach people. The people and so at what point nick did um did you start to realize like were your friends starting to notice like what you were doing and, and making you were getting a little busier maybe making some money like what was that stage that that got to where you were either hiring a trainer or you were creating opportunities for friends who weren't necessarily in northern virginia Correct to have that first or that second location, I guess. Yeah. So, so before we get into that, one thing I I always like to tell people and use this as a kind of a teaching slash talking moment is for everyone listening, when, uh, before we fast forward to to that point, I had to make the decision first to quit the U S secret service right? because the business I did have now, Josh Wilson, the Joe Zitzelberger and, uh, and I had to make a decision like, okay, and I wasn't doing that well this time. Keep in mind, I was right. just doing what I loved, you know, and, but as I said, the secret service, a, a very harsh schedule. So I was burning both ends very strongly. I was doing dogs for five, six hours a day. And then I was right. doing secret service, eight, 10, 12 hours a day. And I got to the point where I was like, okay, I have to make a decision. I can't keep doing this. Not good for my health, not good for my sleep, not good really for anything. Right. And I decided obviously to quit the secret service, which I was a 29, 20, 28, 27 year old, uh, you know, making $110,000 a year government salary, full government benefits. I was eight years into a government retirement, four years Marines, four years secret service. 
And the, the teaching moment that I want to talk to everyone about now that everyone's kind of caught up is there's not a single person in my life at that time, not my mom, my dad, my brother, no best friend, not yeah. a single person in my entire life that supported that decision. Not one. Yep. Everyone said, you're stupid. You're making a horrible decision. You're quitting a $110,000 year federal government job that it took you a year and a half to get. Most people, I mean, the Secret Service is 3,000 people in the world. Right, Most yeah. people never get it. Um, and they're like, and you're giving all of that up to train dogs at an elementary school playground. Oh, yeah. Like, are you insane? Um, so, so what I, so the point to take away from that is don't listen to people. You know, yeah. if you feel good about it and you're passionate about it and you feel like that's your thing, don't listen to what other people say. And I, I genu genuinely feel that mo a lot of people in life aren't successful because they listen to other people and take the advice of other people. Yeah, you got, you're exactly right. Cause so many people, everybody is that, that comfortable part. Correct. Right. It, it's comfortable. Yep. You thought I was crazy to come to Northern Virginia six, <laughs> seven hours <laughs> to and do a one hour longer. Yeah. Logan, how long do we sit in the car that day driving back? I mean, we had to come down through you Northern know, the, Virginia the traffic shore yeah. <laughs> because we, it took us eight hours to get home. I think that one yeah. day and people don't do that. That's crazy. That's inconvenient. Yeah. That is that is uncomfortable. And everyone it, says, literally, that's crazy. It's crazy. Yep. Everyone. That, and when I say there's not a single person in my life that yeah. supported my decision, literally, my mom, they actually did the opposite. They're like, you need to think this through. Right. You're not thinking a lot. Like, and not out of malice. No, just out of fear. Care. Yeah, fear for me, essentially. Because it's fear for themselves. It's like you've done so well at this point in right. your life. You've got a great government job, and you're about to throw away your life right. to pursue yep. this crazy pipe dream that you have in your head. Yep. Um, so, yeah, it's not, it's not out of bad intention, but unfortunately for most people, it does create a yeah. bad thing in their life. Because how, how, there's a lot of people in the world right now that listen to those people. Sure. Uh, most, I would, I would argue most people listen Absolutely. to those people. And one thing I've always been firm on, and I wish everyone would be is you need to believe in yourself, even when other people don't believe in you. Absolutely. Cause there's going to be a lot of those moments and there's going to continue to be in my life and your yep. life and everyone's life, where maybe I do something even crazier, you know, 10 years from now. And there's going to be all those people saying, you've done all this in your life and you're right. about to throw. Um, but so, yeah, that's that's the big takeaway for everyone is, you know, duh, is you got to believe in yourself even when others don't. Yeah. And, you know, now a lot of those people in the Secret Service who's like, you're crazy or stupid, like I've, I heard it all, are literally some of my employees now. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that that's the big thing to that I that I wanted to get out of the way first is you know, believe in yourself and don't, don't listen to the opinions. Well, of what others. were we talking about earlier in the van? We were talking about, you know, people get focused on, Oh, we were talking about a, a another dog training business, mm -hmm. something unfortunate that happened yep. and people were coming to me asking for comments and stuff. I'm like, I don't have a comment. It, it doesn't affect me. It's a sad situation. Um, but I don't know the details. Yeah, I'm not on involved. I focused on my team, yep. my business, my family. And to make those tough decisions, like you have to have blinders on and earmuffs, everything at the same time. You got to be laser. Especially with the internet. Oh, yeah. social media. You got to be <laughs> laser focused, you know, on what your intentions are, what your mission is, and you got to drown Stay out the all course. that noise because it's not going to be easy if it's different. Yeah. You know, and everybody, some people, yeah, will come at you out of malice. Correct. But the people that matter and that will hurt you the most if you're that person with a an entrepreneurial idea, um, or that drive, you want to, you want to, you know, your family's full of doctors and you're like, man, I'm going to go park yeah. ranger yeah. or I'm going to be a lawyer. Family of doctors don't want a lawyer in the family. Correct. You know, you're supposed to be yeah. a doctor. They're wondering what the hell you're doing. You've got to be built a certain way to work through all that. Uh, very, it's a very stuff. mentally tough. You have to create mental toughness. I would say yeah, to sure. drown out the, the naysayers and the negativity um, that to me, I think that's what a lot of it is mental toughness and not start believing other how many times disbelief. in those first 12 to 18 months were you like, shit, my mom was right. <laughs> <laughs> well, right? The, the good thing is for me. And again, I think you can go either way with it. Uh, you know, once you reach that fork in the road where everyone tells you you're an idiot, you can go one way or another. Some people say, oh man, they were right. I should have listened to them. Or for me, it wasn't revenge. 
but it was almost like, I'm going to prove to 100%, you. Yeah. Like now I'm, I was super motivated before, yeah. but now I'm really motivated because yeah. I know that you don't believe in me. So I'm going to prove you wrong now. Right. Um, and clearly at this point, I think everyone agrees I've done that. So. You're, hey, you're doing okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, two Christmases ago, I bought my mom a house. So That's dope, um, That's for, so for a Christmas present. That. Yeah. So she has slightly more belief in me at this point. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and again, as you said it, like I have great parents and, you know, great family. So it wasn't out of like mal. It was, right. just, it was concern. Yeah. It was like, Hey, we, you are not being logical. You are being crazy, which when you, when you, if you dig deep, when you think about it, you kind of are, you know, it's like, wait, am I going to quit a hundred thousand dollar job <laughs> to train dogs at a park? Yeah. You know, when I took 18 months to get this job, I'm halfway into a government retirement. So when you actually look at it from a very factual pro con perspective, yeah, it foolish. does not add up. <laughs> yeah. So, so I get it. Yeah, but when foolish. you add in the pro of getting to meet John Cena, got to <laughs> take risks, right, Jonathan? I mean, and th but it is, it's so funny. And that's where like, when we, we talk about a lot on this show, you know, you've got to keep that focus on why you're doing what you're doing. And because it, when you're, what we talk about all the time, Jonathan, those little steps, those little wins, mm -hmm. those little building blocks, right? It doesn't have to be a home run out the gate, but you get enough singles. You know in how you a get row. a, I say how you get a first down is get, two yeah. to three yards That's at a right. time. And That's you it. just got to keep you know? chipping away and you can't, the noise is just a distraction. Yep. You know, everything's a distraction and it's whether, and the people, unfortunately, that will be the biggest naysayers yep. are the people closest to you. Uh, generally. Yeah. And, Almost always actually, you know, cause like who gives a crap with some random person. Yeah. You're like, whatever. Like, I don't even, I literally, yeah, you're a stranger. Literally don't yeah. know who you are, Correct. you know, but when that friend and we had one, when or I was, the person you trust, and, right. You know, when I was leaving the church, uh, one of my best friends, Bro, don't do it. And we were, <laughs> we were, I was running both for two years at yeah. that point. I was burning up 95 coming to DC. I mean, it was crazy. I'm falling asleep on the highway. I'm stopping at <laughs> some random hotel in Richmond, you know, sleeping for two hours, getting back to the house and going to work and, you know, just crazy stuff. And when I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go all in on this. Huh? <laughs> what? Why? But it's, it's like, if you know, you know, but you also know. If it doesn't work out, I'm going to know I, I left nothing to yeah, chance. Of. I tried it. I tried all I could. Yeah, there was and, nothing to chance. And unfortunately, uh, I, I think most people go through life without taking that chance. They go through life mm -hmm. playing it safe. They take that safe job at the factory, yeah. that even though they're a phenomenal artist or a phenomenal graphic right. designer or a great dog trainer or whatever, yeah. whatever their, their thing is that they love. But unfortunately, most people... And again, I think it's because they listen to those people. Yeah. They go through life playing it safe. Oh, I got a good job. I got good benefits. I got you know, the parking space out front of the office. Yeah. Like, um, and yeah, that if if I could like talk to everyone in the world, that would be one of the things I would talk about. Is you know, what, as you said, worst case scenario, sure. you try to pursue that art. You try to pursue, and you give it your all. It doesn't work out. All right, cool. You go back to the that factory job that job as a vet tech right, right? that it's always going to be there for people you. are afraid of the risk this is the thing that i started thinking about it this way i don't know exactly when but i i think it's key people always focus on the risk of doing something but they never think about the cost of not oh it's it's very true yeah and it's like okay this is scary but what is the cost of me not doing Correct. it like if i didn't try because if i tried at least and now it, you know. And it hit. Yeah. When? Wow. Where would we where would we be? Like where would you be? You know? Right. You'd be in the same where, spot. And that's and you know, if I if I keep going, if I avoid that risk, I still have risk. Oh, I still course. have risk of the business I'm working at mm -hmm. going under. Yeah. They could lay me off for any given reason. They could, you know, do whatever. They're in complete control. But what did I give up? What was that cost? Because I didn't pursue that passion, that art. Or what it, I mean, think about all the People we know that, like when I grew up, some of the best best athletes didn't play the sport. Oh, of course, yeah. And they would have been yeah. freaking Could have incredible, been phenomenal, but they didn't have the discipline. They were unwilling to take that next mm -hmm. step. It's like, well, I don't want to risk this, but the cost it was absurd. You know, there's a there's a really good motivational speaker that I like a lot named Les Brown. I know you're oh, familiar yeah, yeah. with him. And one of the things along those same lines he talks about, and I really liked his perspective, is he said, 
you know, he uh, speaking to thousands of people and he says, what's the richest place on earth? Like, where do you think the richest place with the most money did it on? People raise their hand. They're like, ah, oh, Fort Knox, you know, Bank of America, the World right. Bank, the I, you know, all of this. And he's like, all those are really good, but they're all wrong. The richest place in the world is the graveyards. That's where every invention, every idea, every business yep. that every person's had inside of them that they never pursued that business. They had a great idea or invention in their head yeah. and they had, here's how it works, to, but they never did anything with it. And that all of those died with those people. And he's like, really think about it. If you could add up all of the business ideas, inventions and innovations that were in people's heads, who's died to this day, yeah. it would be trillions and trillions right. and trillions of dollars worth so he's like the richest place in the world is graveyards where all the ideas been businesses and inventions died with the owner yeah. that never pursued them yeah and i'm like that that's it's pretty it's a pretty harsh reality well and we think about all this like people we would say special have made like huge impacts on the world you know the tech just on the technology side so you think about bill gates steve jobs tesla think about tesla uh, yeah. and elon, elon musk and musk. stuff right it's like the special part to me isn't what they brought the special part to me is the dynamic in which like the mentality that they were willing to do. Oh, it's crazy. They were willing to like eat shit sandwiches for like years and years and years mm. and years and years and just go all in on this concept. Yeah. When they had the same thing, yeah, well, they had people telling them, are you kidding me right now? What, what are you doing? When you leave that plan B like I'm a big fan of no plan B, right? They, like they're, I 100% they're, agree. I, I don't have a backup plan. Right. I have my plan and my plan can be fluid. Sure. Because I'm going to adjust to what I come about. But there is no plan B. No. And I, I think that when people have like, well, I've got this backup plan just in case. I mean, you got to be wise, right? But the wisdom right. should be built into plan A. Right. You know, to, to some extent. But it, I, I feel like when people make moves as aggressive as you guys did, if you're, <laughs> if you have a very solid, safe plan B there, subconsciously, I think everybody plays to plan B. 100%. And, and it, it holds you back from really making that big risk at what you're going for. Right. And so you're saying, hey, look, we've got six weeks to figure this out. And it's not necessarily in that scenario, like we have six weeks to replace my salary, but we've got six weeks to close this gap to sure. where we, to where we can buy another six months, right? To where we can flip that into buying another six months, right? You know, and attack it and create what you guys have now created 10 years later. That's yeah. awesome. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in plan B only gets in the way of plan A. Mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. Too, too much parachute becomes problematic. Yeah. You know, I had a t-shirt on as my big tail was on the treadmill this morning and um, it says run the play on it. And, you know, I, it's just a, a reminder and of run the play. We have the plan. We know what it is. We know the steps we have to take to execute. Like if, if things are hitting the fan, like are we running the play appropriately? Right. Right. And, and we were on a show, actually a show that aired today. Jonathan made a reference to players contracts and, you know, sharing the playbook with them and all those things. And just to go with another sports analogy, you know, teams don't have one play, one play, you know, there's right. not, there's not one setup. There's not one strategy, but there is the plan. There is the goal. Sure. And there's, there's a million micro decisions that play into that. Right. And what is the appropriate play at the appropriate time and put all of your energy and focus into that strategic play. Right. And so this t-shirt, I just love it. It says run the play and it's got like a little routes, like of the receivers running and <laughs> right, the, like the running back. Yeah. It looks like the uh, chalkboard, like old school, like coaches, you know, yeah. chalkboard, but it's little dollar signs and cents. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's like run the play. Right. And um, I, I just, I love that, you know, plan B gets in the way of plan A. It does because we want to, people instinctually look for safety. And they, pull, oh, they, they play it safe and I don't blame them. Not I get all. it. I make those decisions probably daily without even knowing it. Yep. Um, but th that importance of keeping plan B out of the way of plan A is, is a big deal. Yeah. And, and it's important to be nimble and it's important to understand when you, you know, have to take a new path yeah. because, you know, wherever you were going, isn't going to work. Right. But any kind of, you know, plan B that is an automatic of, I'll just go get a job. Yep. 
it is going to deter any success I think you're going to have long term in your own shop. Agree. Totally agree. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Don't work plan A to death when it's obviously not working. Right. Nimble. Right. Be nimble. Yeah, you got to know when plan A sucks. <laughs> but. <laughs> there becomes a new plan right. A. Right. You need like plan A subpart one, right. not plan B. I mean, we, you know, you talked about the young family. Like I can relate with that a lot. So 2004, Logan was born. Mm-hmm. Um, and late 2004. Right before he's born, Devin's probably seven months pregnant. I left my job, opened my own mortgage shop, um, took on leases, hiring people, all this stuff. And everyone, uh, Devin's family, Devin's friends, like, what the hell is he doing? Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure our family thought we were out of our minds. I mean, out of our minds. Now, four or five years later, market crashes, tanks, we lose everything, bankrupt. I mean, completely just wrecked and destroyed. And everybody, several, I'm sure, had a, <laughs> I told you, you know, I told sure. you so. You know, here's the thing. Even if I was with the job that I had, it impacted everybody. Yeah, the market I still, still would have been totally screwed. Like, we <laughs> right. still would have been in a total shit show. Yeah. Um, we just personally had liability for all of it. <laughs> right. So, you know, but hey, we rebuilt and and it's fine. But like when we did that, there wasn't a backup plan. Like we were all in and it worked and it worked well for a long time until the world decided that it wouldn't. Right. And if I wasn't so young and arrogant at that time, I would have paid more attention to the writing on the walls and made different decisions. Back then though, I believe that my plan, my plan A was better than everybody else's plan A. And if I kept working it, I just outwork everybody and we'd be fine. Sure. And I believed that all the way to bankruptcy court. I mean, that was, that right. was the, the deal. I, I wasn't nimble. I wasn't willing to change. Now, fast forward 13 years, eight years into a, a, another business that we're doing okay with, man, I'm about as nimble as can be not physically. I'm working on getting more <laughs> nimble physically, right? but man, if something's not working, we're going to change that mug. Oh if, yeah. If, if someone's, if somebody on my team, you came in, you met some people, you know, on the admin team and stuff. If they give pushback challenges, because they're the ones doing the tasks. They're the ones doing the work. Doesn't mean I'm always excited about the pushback and the changes they're proposing sure. or the question. It doesn't mean I always agree, but we've got it. We change stuff a lot. And that can be hard for a growing organization because sometimes people will feel like, Hey, it's not stable. There's not stability. There's constant changing. What's going on? But when young businesses are growing, you have to be able to move and transition. Oh, yeah. The number of times that we use the term growing pains in our office right. <laughs> on any given day. Yeah. You know, because it's, it's just the nature of the beast. I mean, you know, I guess at the end of 2019, we were a five partner shop. Like, that was it. It was just the five of us. We had gone through an intentional, um, degrowth period. Yeah. Um, after uh, growing way too fast uh, at a, at a certain point, we had scaled it all back. It was just the partners, and we brought on the fifth partner. Yeah. And then from that point forward, we've you know three or four x our revenue. We're now a team of sixteen or seventeen. That's awesome. You know, we run a strong intern program with the local colleges. We have all the services that we provide under our corporate umbrella yeah, that's awesome. versus having to outsource. So, I mean, you have to be willing to, to see where things are going right. and how to take advantage of that. And also know when you're on the wrong path. Yeah. And being able to provide those solutions, like you talked about clients are like, Hey, can you do this for us? And you're like, yeah, we can do that. Sure. And now let's figure out how the heck right. to, to do, to build websites. Let's yep. figure out how to do social media marketing and, and advertising. Um, let's figure out, man, a lot of our clients have this need for uh, commercial video work or photography. They're asking us for this, how we should bring this in. Yep. You know, and how do we figure that out? So as you've grown, and like when I look at your partners, it looks like each of you guys bring this separate skill set and specialty yes. yep. and that have allowed you. And I, I presume that those relationships were acquired and grew. They were previous relationships, but they came in house as you guys grew and that need 
became apparent where outsourcing it no longer made sense. Right. And that's exactly how our growth has happened. It would, you know, a matter of, you know, we start to get enough requests for a certain service and then we outsource it for a certain amount of time. Right. Then we start to run numbers and we realize, you know, this is consistent enough that it makes more sense to us have more control. And while we're taking a financial risk by bringing it in house, we also reap the financial rewards. Yeah. Cause the margins are always better when it's under your own roof. For sure. Um, so that's how everything has grown. And then the partnership group has kind of grown in kind because we all have different skill sets right. and bring something very different to the table. So when we get to a point where we know, okay, we either want to bring a new service online or we have a service that we know we need to take to the next level and right. we don't have that expertise in house. That's when the real growth begins internally. Yeah. That's where we start adding people. That's where we started adding service lines under the consociate tag. Right? Look, I could talk about cookie text and just business and the same thing. Like it's it. When you get your passion, when you're lucky enough and disciplined enough to pay attention to getting your passion in alignment with your purpose mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to steal from anything it is limitless yeah. i mean you can just run with it um sean aker studies happiness mm -hmm. and he has a quote i really like and he says happiness is the joy you feel as you're working towards your potential yeah and i think that's that's it it's hanging on my fridge because those moments of joy and that sense that i'm continuously trying to be the best version of myself and yep. put the best product out there and be a good boss and a good human. Yeah. yeah. It's funny that you said that because the episode that dropped today while we're in the studio recording, actually, you know, I reference like, I want to be the greatest and it's not the greatest dad of all time. It's not the greatest, like, entrepreneur of all time i don't feel this desire to be like the greatest husband of all like i don't need any of those accolades i need though the people that matter in my life that when it's all said and done to all believe at their core damn he was the greatest version he could have been of himself of josh Wilson. like that's it yeah. that's it and like my dad could not have been a greater dad to me because I'm not being compared to other dads. Mm -hmm. I want Devin to know when I'm <laughs> no, when we're no longer physically together, whether she departs or I depart, because that's a reality of what will happen. Mm -hmm. There is not, there is so much joy in knowing he was the greatest husband that he could have been to me. There's nothing that he could have given me more of. And it's not of stuff and things like yeah. of me, like of my heart, yeah. my core, yeah. what it can be. And so this episode that dropped is I'm talking about my dislike of myself in the physical form and what I've allowed myself to become and be because I'm not I'm misrepresenting my potential. Yeah. And I've caught clips and I've caught right? clips of a few things lately. So I know what yeah. your current. And so is. it's just like a weird thing. And it, it's like. Get your, get your focus, you know, and, and figure out like how you do become that greatest version of yourself. It's not about anyone else. It's about yourself. Have you read or listened to Atomic Habits by mm -hmm. James Clear? Yes. Yeah. Every action I take is a vote for the type of person I want to become. Yep. And consistency over in intensity. Yeah. And so I, I'm not knocking the 75 hard, but yeah. that's intensity. Oh, it's and, super and, intensity. And, yeah. And that, you know, you sign up for a marathon that's intensity. If you say I'm going to go out and I'm going to run more days each week than I don't. Yep. And even if it's only around the block yeah. in three years, I'm a runner. That's so right. Who am I? I want yeah. to be a, a fit person. Yeah. And you work toward the person yep. you want to become rather than I want to run a marathon. Yeah. And I think that to that point, it's so smart. And that comes back to business too. People see what they, the, you talked about the nervousness of starting the business, right? Yeah. And it's because you're like, it's a business. Yes. And that's so intimidating. And if I was like, I need to lose 80 pounds, that's so intimidating. That's so intimidating. And that's why, and I've always attacked it that way it, it, from a very immature aspect. And this time, the time, the last time, mm -hmm. I'm not worried about that. 
I'm worried about today and what I need to do. And it's the same way I approach my business. And, you know, Lord willing, like the business continues to be successful. Lord willing, my wife continues to love me. My kids continue to love me. And, you know, and, and, and I just focus on the day and being that yeah, best and, in the day. And, it doesn't matter. And then, boom, you wake up and 11 years later, you're pumping out more cookies than you've ever pumped out in your life. Yeah. And you, you sit there on the couch and you think to yourself, I want to be a, a fit person that can pick up her grandkids. Yeah. And so what does a fit person do? Does she stay here on the couch and eat this bowl of Chex Mix and watch this right. reality show? Or does she go for a walk around the block Yep. and, you know, listen to something that might make yeah. her feel better about life? You know, because it's every decision. Yep. Every, every decision. single one of them. And it's not 75 days of decision nope. or one marathon worth of decisions. Right. It's, it's just little tiny incremental choices. In every aspect of your life exactly exactly it's so simple hmm? you look great you look excited you look Thank full you, of energy oh, i know energy. i know I, can now, <laughs> I may completely just fall out in the next 45 <laughs> minutes so we might have to keep it short but look so i'm so excited you're here in the studio today um let we talked about these deposits the relational equity that we have with each other absolutely um and it's been a minute i thought it would be funny to to take them back um because gosh we met in fall of 2010 yes. correct wow dude that's a good memory um fall of 2010 um we both had started working at water's edge okay yep and we're we're like knowing each other for what a couple months a couple months at and do best. We did, yeah we didn't run across each other that much even no. in the office uh-uh. and and what happened what what was <laughs> how do we really get to know each other larry <laughs> well I mean, it was, it was a crazy story, really, because, um, you know, I had a, I, we had a mutual friend in the office yes. um, who came to me, and he said, uh, he said, Larry, he said, you want to go hiking on the Appalachian Trail? And, I mean, I was pretty good friends with this guy. And I don't know anything about hiking, dude. Like, I'm, yeah, just nothing. So I'm like, I don't know, man. He's like, come on, man. It's going to be fun. Me and Josh and Josh's friend is going. So I want you to go. So like Josh, you know, we're kind of friends and then he's going to have a friend and I want to have a friend too. So I really want you to come. And I was like, okay. So he, he, uh, he got me to go on this trip. He like talked me into it. And we were so excited. <laughs> I was going to ride with him. You and uh, you and uh, John were going to ride mm -hmm. together. And we were going to go up there and get everything. Well, dude, the day before, the night before we're supposed to go, I get a call. And my buddy's not going. Right. So this damn fool texted me <laughs> yesterday, actually. I haven't talked to him in a hot minute. And he texted me yesterday sharing some love, and I need to hit him up today. Okay. But, yeah. yes, that's uh, really funny. Yeah. Well, I do, and come on now. I love the guy. I still love the guy. Same. But he dropped the ball all over the place. He Didn't we take him shopping? We took like him shopping like, like two, two nights, nights before. before. <laughs> yes, dude, exactly. Jonathan, we are running around Walmart and Bass Pro getting all kinds of gear. Mm-hmm. Because this trip we'd been planning for a month. Uh, yeah, like a month, month and, and a half. half. Yeah, absolutely. Homeboy had prepared not even like an ounce for this trip. And we're going into the wilderness for days not to come out. Yes. <laughs> I've been in Bass Pro Shop like twice. I'm a big proponent of leave nature alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fair. But yeah, I don't blame. I mean, I think my comfort have uh, shifted over the last 12 years. Yeah, things yeah. I prefer. But it, it is a good time. But you need to be prepared. And what people consider levels of preparedness, mm -hmm. I, I would say vary <laughs> from personality to personality. And we'll get into that a little bit. So so someone not to be named, let's just refer to them as Stefan. Yes. Okay. okay? That's great. <laughs> Stefan bailed. Yeah, Stefan before. said My uh, belly hurts. Yes. He said, My belly hurts and I'm not going. <laughs> I was like, I was like, dude, I can't believe we're doing this. I was like, I mean, and, and Josh, no, just I was like, I don't know this guy, Josh, right? And I don't know uh, John. Yeah, I was like, but their count on worked with us all. Yes, time. absolutely. Yes. I was like, I don't know these guys, and now you got you're bailing, and I'm going into the woods for three days with two men that I just don't know at all. And None of that uh, sounds right. Uh, yeah. 
yeah, like that, a situation. You yeah, no, no. Into. I was like, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no. It's it was what not. the kids call a uh, pause nowadays. <laughs> pause. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. So I said, uh, I said, dude, I don't know what's going on. But anyway, uh, we went on the trip, and what a time we had! And uh, it was wild. Yeah, it was it the was three wild. of us. The three of us. We went and. None of us knew what we were doing. I think John probably knew the most. And, uh, you know, we just did our best to spend three days in the forest. What were, um, what are the trail names? Oh, remember? Dude, I, I absolutely remember. Well, share the trail I, names. Um, John was the doc because my, uh, my foot needed surgery on the trip. So you get your trail names. If you've never hiked the Appalachian Trail, the, the trail gives you the name uh-huh. like it. You don't pick your name before you go. You The trail gives it to you. So, so we got Doc Goodwood. Doc Goodwood <laughs> was John for doing surgery on my foot. I was gears because I had put together a, a mess of equipment. You had so much stuff. Dude, the, my backpack was overflowing. Stuff was falling off of it. <laughs> so- <laughs> I think I think, I think after my shit is still on the Appalachian Trail near uh, Harper's Ferry. Oh, God. So, so, uh, didn't mean to drop it, but the bag wouldn't hold. And then, uh, so I was gearhead and then, uh, you were looking out for us the whole time, Josh, you cared. And so <laughs> you, you were the trail mother, Yes, trail mother, <laughs> which had many implications. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the trail mother, uh, w- was the boss of the trip. So it, I it think was it was about 30 seconds into that trip. I fell and mother. <laughs> well, I played into why that, I, I screamed. That's it. exactly what it was. I wasn't going to bring that up, but no, we, I we, it. <laughs> if, if you can imagine, we were so excited to be on the trail. <laughs> we were like, we were like little kids. We were so excited. We were probably 50 yards in and uh, Josh falls. I at, ate it. Dude, I mean, it was raining in your leg. Yeah, it was raining. Well, I remember having that big ass backpack on and I looked to the right as I realized, okay, my back isn't broken. But I can see my my foot. I was like, oh, oh yeah, this ain't good. Mm-mm. And I was a much smaller man than I am now, <laughs> but I was still a large man. Mm-hmm. And um, Larry and John are like, ah, uh, yeah, your leg was bent in a you, way. You good? Everything good? I was like, well, we're about to find out. Yeah, it was Pop bent up. In Everything's cool. But the thing is, if you don't know, if you're not into hiking or you know you don't know much about the Appalachian Trail, particularly the largest section of the Appalachian Trail, which runs through Virginia, yes, sir. our beautiful western part of our state here. Um, in the fall, it's cloudy and rainy, and there's a lot of leaves. A lot of And leaves. they fall off the trees, and they cover up all the rocks and things of that nature. Um, and so wet leaves on top of rocks, oh. big rocks, become slightly hazardous. And my ass just took off down this trail. We're so and my excited. Ass took off on you the were- ground too. When I fell. <laughs> you were leading the way. It was a hot mess. So we spent that trip was what three days? Yeah, we were three days in the forest. Three days. Three days in the woods. In the forest. We dropped a. We had one car. We all rode together. Yeah, we we had to do that. Stefan. Stefan couldn't kind of messed up that deal. Yeah. So we had to find some random person, um, a service super cheap, um, oh, to to drive us back to our car. Yeah. But the reality is we just, we parked the car, Jonathan, and we just started hiking north. Mm -hmm. And we knew at some point we would get to Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. We just had to follow the white blaze. The white blaze. It's a real three wise men situation y'all had going on. We were following the star. We were following the star. I will tell you (laughs) that that first night was one of the sketchiest nights of my life. Yeah, It was was kind of my fault because... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> i was I, I was so excited to see the water i wanted to see the shenandoah river yes so i um I, I planned for us to leave the safety of the appalachian trail yes and take a side trail uh-huh. um if you're just getting to start into hiking and you're interested don't do this uh when you're just starting off yeah and so side trails are cool like there's lots of things you can go see and yeah. do like when you're hiking whether it's appalachian trail or others there's usually you know, little, little side spots to go to. Mm -hmm. The problem is when you're on the Appalachian trail, this trail runs along the top of the mountains. Right. So even maybe those who aren't great with like geography and stuff, Mm -hmm. um, you know, just real baseline rivers are typically not at the The top top of the mountains. So if you want to see the river, Mm -hmm. like be up next to it, you have to go down the mountain you're hiking to find it. And then, you know, at some point, you got to go back up the mountain. Up the mountain. Oh, to gosh. get to where you're going. So it's our first day. 
my ass ate it early on. <laughs> you know, we we started out really hot. It's cloudy. It's rainy. It's cold. We're just like blowing through you know our energy we're eating snacks a half mm -hmm. a mile in oh yeah i dude. mean we're all soft like yes. this is not we're not hardened people to go into the woods right. um various levels of experience most of which from like 30 years prior you know, <laughs> exactly children, yeah and we went camping. <laughs> yeah so how far down did you guys have to go to get to the river far so, um, dude, so very far. miles very far yeah how far is the, your town river right over there Oh, Look, no, but that's not on. the yeah, Shenandoah. Yeah, yeah it was a Shenandoah. It was Shenandoah, <laughs> and, which was a very good river to us in years to follow. Uh, we had some fun on it. You yes, know, we did. And stuff, but we we hiked down, and, and we're running late. It's dark now, all right? Well, and we didn't have any idea what it meant two miles. Like, I thought two no. miles was nothing. We got this. But, dude, you got 40-pound pack on, and you're hiking over rocks and terrain that's trying to kill you every step. So it's dark now. We oh. have our headlamps going. Um, some of us with flashlights because we didn't have headlamps. And we're walking down this trail, heading towards what we believe to be the river. It is now pitch black. Oh, no. We are in the woods. The noises we start hearing. <laughs> what was going on in the forest? Are crazy. <laughs> I pull my gun out. Yes, you so did. So I'm walking, headlamp, <laughs> gun. Larry's got his it lights. It sounded like there were demons in the forest. It was the weird shit, man. It was it weird. Wasn't good. So we finally get to a flat area. And mm -hmm. I don't even think at night we realized we were at the river. We couldn't the, see anything. We could, it was pouring down rain. It was nuts. Yeah. Everybody, we just said, There was no it. moonlight, no starlight. We threw our tents up. We just found kind of a little flat area. We threw the tents up, said, F it. Like, we'll see you in the morning. Yep. That was a long ass night, man. I didn't it was sleep storming at all. like crazy. Um, Larry's tent. Basically, his father-in-law. No, no, no. Who? <laughs> it was, uh, was Tony Dominique. Yeah. Okay. So, a great guy, Tony Dominique, lends Larry all kinds of gear. And um, this tent, it is a uh, vinyl coffin. Let's call it what it is. It looked is. like a coffin. It was when I set it up. Horrific. It was. It was. It was the size of half this table. You couldn't move when you were in it. You just slid in it and then yeah, zipped it was, your head up. It was bad news. <laughs> I and believe so, that's called a body bag. Dude, it, dude, it was it a, body, was a bag. body bag with a pole attached to it. I mean, it was what, small. When I set it up, I was like, what have I done? Yeah. And so it just pours it storms all night. We hear branches falling all around us. I'm like, a tree is going to fall on me and kill me. I think this is how it's going to end. This is so dumb. <laughs> we wake up the next morning. I peek out the tent. And you're already up, I think. Oh, yeah. I just and, stayed up all night. And Larry is standing by the bank of the river. The river we had made it. And there were, across the river, is a farm. And there's all these cows. So all I can imagine what we were hearing when these cows banging all night. Because it was. Dude, the cows like, were into the cows some romance. Were, they, there was a lot of romance going on. It was the, very loud. Across the way. <laughs> so, but we had no clue. And it was a beautiful spot. But in our minds, where we were at, we for me at least, I created this hell. I'm in this place where I'm going to die. Nothing yeah. good is going to come of this. What's going on? That was me. Sorry. Um, it, it, it's just chaos. But in the morning, the sun was out. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. It was the coolest place. We had a little breakfast. We were actually near a waterfall. We didn't even know it. Didn't even know it. There was a waterfall. <laughs> the Shenandoah River was there. It was gorgeous. It was a really cool experience, and um, we hiked out. Now, here's the funny thing about mm -hmm. that first trip, and this was the first of many trips, okay, guys? We probably, what did you do, six, seven trips all together? Yeah, so, we yeah, had we've people got about, join us on a yeah, couple. Yeah, we've got about 290 miles under our belt. That's a big deal. That is deal. true. That's that a big true. deal. We hiked from Harper's Ferry all the way to Shenandoah National Park. Oh, we completed the park. Uh, well, we got like three miles left. But Do we? Mm -hmm. I yeah, we, we got all the way to... Um, no, you're right. We're at the priest. The priest. The priest is on the south side down of Wintergreen. Yeah, and that, Drive. that stopped us from going back. Yeah, we looked at that and we're like, mm, maybe next year. And that's yeah. been seven years, yeah. maybe eight. Yeah. So, <laughs> Larry, though, that first trip. So, day one, Larry's in sweatpants. Oh, yeah. And remind you, it's pouring down rain. It's a bad idea. So, Larry's in sweatpants and sneakers. Mm -hmm. and, and like, Yeah, they were uh, Skechers. <laughs> yeah, they were Skechers. for the Appalachian Trail. These, these aren't boots. So, he already mentioned how John got his name because his foot was jacked with blisters Blisters from the um, sketchers. So day two, he's carrying sopping wet sweatpants in his bag. Added about 10 pounds. I mean, to an already incredibly heavy bag. And I see Larry changed and ready to go for the day. 
in the Skechers, but he's wearing corduroy pants. <laughs> corduroy. <laughs> it's so stupid. I was like, nothing can absorb more water than this, the Hanes sweatpants he was wearing the day before. <laughs> I was wrong. Corduroy. <laughs> you didn't know I had pants. corduroy in the bag, I baby. Had no clue. I had corduroy in the bag. He dressed for a weekend at church camp. I mean, he had so much stuff. And yep. it, but hey, I will tell you this. You knocked out that trip. And we did it. You were not a punk no. by any means. No. You manned up. I was soaking wet the whole time. It it was so fun, but so miserable at the same time. Yeah. We had a couple little bucket list items that we had kind of like, hey, we want to do this, we want to do that. And Larry, one of the things Larry really wanted to do was like drink from like a, 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 str- a mountain stream, mountain stream, <laughs> straight from the stream. So, uh, John, John's very analytical. John is um, he's he's very smart. Yeah, he, uh, he knows a lot of things. He really does. Um, he loves to process things. Yes. And um, John, God love him, also likes to make things way more difficult than they need to be. Yeah. Uh, when we think about it, John, I, I feel like you're kind of in the middle. And like I'm kind of like fly yeah. by night, seat of the pants. Mm-hmm. John's on the far other far extreme, yes. analytical, and then I feel like you're right in the dead middle. Yeah. So we're going along, and and so if I'm going to choose what stream to drink out of, I'm going to let John decide which one makes the most sense. That's right? exactly right. And he also had like wilderness survival training in the military and all that crap, which which I did not. He was the good choice. Okay. So we're like, we'll let John decide. Yep. So well, guys, you know, I think based on the pitch of this. This waterfall and the way this is the speed at which it's moving, this is good water. And we're like, shit, okay, yeah, no problem. <laughs> so John takes his his cup, mm-hmm. scoops the water out, takes a sip. Because John will take one for the team. John is a great dude to have in your corner because he will take he one will for lead the, team. the way. Yep, he will he will find out. Always gotta have the homie who's willing to get dysentery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John was. John we were heading right he down that first. Road. But we all chased a little too quick behind to see if it really would affect <laughs> anything. So John drinks. Larry takes it, drinks. Larry <laughs> Larry hands it to me, and I cup. knew you. I knew you. I knew you were sketchy about this. That's yeah. why. So yeah. I really wanted you to do this with me. It was important. <laughs> so Larry hands me the cup. I take the cup. I start to drink. I hesitate, and, and I there, knew there was something. something floating in the cup. <laughs> Larry immediately says, "What no, do you no, say, I Larry?" Knew th- I knew there was something in the cup because I had seen it, and I was like, "Josh isn't gonna drink it." <laughs> And I was so sad because I wanted you to be a part of it. <laughs> so I I was ready for it, except I didn't have what I was gonna say ready. But you looked at you looked at it and you saw the little thing floating in the cup. And then you looked at me and I said, Don't worry, Josh. That is from my mouth. <laughs> yes. And I looked at him, I'm like, okay, and I drank the whole thing. I just crushed it. And he didn't say that's from my mouth. He goes, It's of my mouth. <laughs> I did. I said, Don't worry, Josh, that's of my mouth. That's of my mouth. And I was like, Okay. And just well, that must be it. totally fine. Yeah, it must be fine. I, yep. Why of your mouth was better than the stream. Yeah, and what know. black stuff was coming out of your mouth. And that's where the pandemic started. Probably. <laughs> it is. We were ground zero for COVID, I guess. Oh, wow. But man, that was such a crazy trip. And that's one of my most favorite <laughs> memories. I mean, there's so many from our times on the trail and stuff, but that damn cup story, I don't know how many times I've told that <laughs> over the years. And we have video of that. Yeah, we remember do. when we made our poor families come over to the house and I cooked, I made you barbecue cooked, and, and we, we played like the 45 minute video yes, of our trip. I, I recorded the, the trip <laughs> and then I edited it and I put terrible music behind it because it was the free Some music that came music. with the camera. Yeah. It was like a banjo. Oh my God. And we made everybody watch it. And they were so bored. The Everyone kids couldn't have given a crap. Nobody cared, but we loved it. We laughed so hard. I mean, it was a, a tremendous video. We should actually, um, if I can find it, we might have posted it on Facebook. If I can find it, um, we might put some clips and promo for for this week. Yeah, of, that'd be fantastic. That would be a really fun thing to to remember. 